Welcome back to Open Line. We are talking about medical malpractice in Tennessee. We have medical malpractice attorney Clint Kelly with us, and uh, we're just basically going to start hearing from you. What are some situations that that you have that you think uh, may rise to the level of a suit or not? Uh, let's go to Reese right now. Hello, Reese. Hi. Um, I experienced the situation in 2003, and uh, with my daughter, and I tried to do a malpractice suit. She was given the wrong medications in the emergency room, and this is how I learned how to use a computer. And in any event, the classic a test that came uh, came up from um, John Hopkins for the uh, doctors, a, a pretest, and the actual last question said, which does not apply, and they, and they did the classic wrong thing to my daughter and when i tried to sue it was here in nashville i came to find out that each county has different malpractice laws for example here in nashville i was only allowed even though i called 60 different doctors all over the united states i called the cdc she told me to pursue this at all costs etc etc i came to find out that in Davidson County, you had to have three Davidson County only doctors sign off that she was given the wrong treatment. And then upon further, when I went to all the lawyers, they kept telling me, this does not mean you don't have a case. It means we cannot take it at this time. It must have been 15 people. She was in the law business, by the way. In any event, I came to find out also that 99 point three percent of all the doctors and lawyers in Davidson County had graduated from Bentonville. And I found that to be uh what is the legal term? You know, isn't that uh, Okay, well let's let's talk about what you're saying. Hold on here if you want to. What 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 do you think about some of what she's saying here? All right. The laws don't differ from one county to the next. It's state laws. It's statewide. Now how those laws are applied can be different from one judge to the next, but they're supposed to be uniform Ben. I mean you're supposed to have the the same type of requirements statewide. I don't know what happened in her case to make uh, Davidson County different. There is no requirement to have three experts on board uh, before you file a lawsuit, and that's certainly one of the case in 2003. Now you have to have an expert that can testify that will sign off on the lawsuit. It's called a certificate of good faith, and we have to have that before we sue. Uh, so that is a change. but. The notion well, that you had to have three, that doesn't sound it, right. Well, it wasn't. That's and I, right. I can't account for why that happened to her. And I don't know, maybe she misunderstood or, or she got some bad legal advice. Uh, and, of course, we do know that most of the doctors and lawyers in Nashville do not come from Vanderbilt. That I can attest to <laughs> as, a, as a proud <laughs> Memphis graduate. How tough is it to get that expert? So every case does require an expert to sign off on it. How tough is it to get that person? It is... For those of us who do this, and we're a small fraternity, there's a small group of lawyers that do this from the uh, patient side, we have uh, avenues, established avenues for finding uh, experts. It, it can be tough if you have to find a really um, a unusual type of expert. There are those like, say, in maternal fetal medicine, there are pediatric oncologists. Uh, we, we, I call them four-leaf clovers. They, they are tough to find, but general surgeons, family practitioners, um, those types of folks, they're, they're not hard to find, and there are many that will agree to review a case. Now, there's a difference, Ben, between finding somebody and finding somebody good. Right, right. And you always want to find somebody who's good, because if they're not, then you don't want to you don't want to go into battle with them. And, and you hear sometimes doctors are reluctant to to testify against a fellow doctor. They are, and that's why you have to get, we have to get experts typically out of state. Uh, someone from uh, what we call a contiguous state, which is you know, Alabama, Kentucky, Arkansas, because the doctors in Tennessee don't want to testify against other doctors, which you know I can understand, because if I were contacted to testify against a lawyer in Tennessee who I might see at a professional association, I would be reluctant to to do that as well. So that's that's what we typically do is find doctors from out of state. Let's go to Lewis. Hello, Lewis. Yeah. Uh, go right ahead. Well, I got five striker bolts in my back and I could dive a plate or something back there. Right in my spine between my shoulders. Okay. 
And then that, that, that happened in the emergency room. They put me in the common emergency room and took me up. And I got the x-rays before we operate and the x-rays after the operation. Now you have to have the operation. Now have you tried to bring a lawsuit? Yeah, they told me been too hot. They told you what? Dr. Rick, Richard Davis, Rick Davis, he uh, left Tennessee, I reckon, he was out there at Vanderbilt. So you tried to bring a lawsuit? I tried to, I can't find a lawyer. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. It's been too long, you know, and he ain't twisted my body, too. So I had a crack all the way across. I up I had my body and, and across the midsection. Well, ask him, Ben, when did this happen? Well, how long ago did this happen, Lewis? Uh, 2006. Mm. 2006. Too long. Again, it's... Uh, you need to bring the claim within one year of discovering the injury. Now, he may not have discovered it for a year or two. It sounds like he would have discovered it early on. We have another statute. It's another protection for doctors and hospitals, which is if you don't bring your claim within three years of the negligent act, you're barred. Period. No matter what. And no matter what. I mean, it's confusing to say, say, Mr. Kelly, I thought you said one year. Now you're saying three years. You got to do it within one year of discovering the injury. But let's say you don't discover it, but for a year and a half uh, or two years after you have the injury, and then you you bring the claim. That's okay. But if you go over three years, you're completely barred unless there's been fraud. So his claim is completely barred. Okay. Sorry, Lewis. Very unfortunate. Let's go to Lulu. Hello, Lulu. Yeah. Hi, what's on your mind? Uh, I had a couple of things. Um, first of all, I wonder if Mr. Kelly could address, um, in a personal injury situation, um, it seems like the closer a person is to retirement age, the less um, attractive they are from an attorney standpoint in terms of representation. And I can also tell you that while this lady that uh, just uh, the, the caller may have been misguided when she raised uh, when she just 93% of the people or the attorneys and judges or whatever had uh, an association with Vanderbilt. I can tell you that when I sought the services of an attorney to assist me in a case, uh, the first thing, and it had, and, and it, it involved Vanderbilt, the first thing I was told is that was going to be an obstacle right away because he didn't cite uh, the figure 93%, but um, I can tell you that the judge that I did eventually land before is a Van, Van, Vanderbilt graduate, and so while this might be an exaggerated figure, I think it, it is, is a problem, and, and I think um, I'm not making any accusations against, against Mr. Kelly. I've seen him on this, this program and other programs, and I, I value his, uh, his um, uh, expertise, but he is not going to come forward and, and um, I, I mean, he, he will deny, obviously, 93% if it's, if it's wrong, but um, he's going to stop short of saying anything when he has to appear before a judge who's a grad, grad, Vanderbilt graduate. And I don't know in Hendersonville if, if that's, I mean, in Sumner County if that's an issue, but it, it, it is in Davidson County for sure. The right. power of Vanderbilt, you're saying, is an issue? Yes, sir. yes ma'am. Yes, right. <laughs> it's all right. Let's take these one at a time, Lulu. Uh, you are correct that age, increasing age, makes cases... Uh, less attractive and the reason for that is we now have caps used to be you could take cases for for el from elderly people uh, people who are getting close to retirement because you might not have much lost earning capacity but you still had the ability to prove non-economic damages to an amount that the jury saw fit there was no cap on it now there is every one of these cases are capped at 750 if you have no lost earning capacity so you can thank the General Assembly for doing that to you because the byproduct of that tort reform was to basically wipe out an entire strata of cases uh, for people that are getting towards retirement or after retirement. So you're saying it's harder for older people to bring one of these? Absolutely. It killed them. Wow. It just killed, because and somebody might say, well, gee, $750,000, gee, Mr. Kelly, that's a whole lot of money. Well, these cases can cost up to $100,000 to get to trial. And they are notoriously cheap. When I say cheap, I mean the defendants are cheap in terms of the offers that they make because they know they win 80% of the cases. So there's a huge risk on the lawyer uh, to take the case to trial. And if you know that this is the best I can do and it's never going to be full compensation, then lawyers steer away from these cases. It, it's just a, it's, And it's business. I'm going to tell you right now, it's all it is. It's business because... If you start taking those cases and you lose them or you can't make any money off of them, then you're going to have to go find something else to do. You go do divorce work. 
The second point is about Vanderbilt. And Lulu, if you want to know my position about Vanderbilt, you go online and you look up Mercer versus Vanderbilt University, which was a trial that occurred in 1999, went all the way to Supreme Court, and we got a $7 million verdict against Vanderbilt. So I got no fear whatsoever of Vanderbilt, and I got no fear of going in front of a judge against Vanderbilt. Right now, I got a case against Vanderbilt in federal court. Vanderbilt is a good hospital. It has a good reputation, but they still make mistakes. It's that simple. And because of that, patients have to get good representation, and Vanderbilt does pay claims when they make mistakes. And it doesn't matter whether a judge went to Vanderbilt because even a judge is going to expect to get reasonable care at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Let's always remember that. Everyone understands whether you went to school there or not. The medical center is a completely different it's basically another entity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we all expect to get good care there and so uh, you look up Mercer versus Vanderbilt and you'll see my experience with Vanderbilt. Okay all right thank you for the call let's go to Mary. Hello Mary. Mary are you there? Yes. Is this Mary? I'm sorry Mary. Larry. 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 I'm so sorry I thought they said yeah. Mary. Go right ahead Larry. Hey let me explain my situation. All right. For 12 years, I've had diabetes. Little by little, I lost my toenails on the big toes. When they were finally down to the bottom, I thought I'd better show my primary and let her see if there's a way to save them or get a stronger antifungal or whatever. So I showed him to her. She said, let me send you a podiatrist so that he can get it straight. I went to the podiatrist, and he uh, looked at him and said, I've seen worse. He was walking out of the room. I said, well, at least for my money, could you show me how to trim my toenails correctly? He grabbed the trimmer out of a drawer that clanked with a bunch of other trimmers or medical tools and started showing me how to trim them. He said, you trimmed them about the way they should be trimmed. Okay. Good. I just wanted to know. Then he pulled out a knife. I told him I grow callus on them every six months or so and I take it off and leave two layers of skin above the regular epidermis so that it will protect it. Okay, move, we have to move along. What, what, what's your question? He decided to cut off all the callus down and squeeze my toe up till blood came to the top. Then he didn't give me any antibiotic or any antifungal and walked out of the room. Okay, how long ago was this? This was September of this year. All right, and you're wondering, is this a a possible lawsuit. Yes. All right. What do you think of that? Diabetic foot is a very, very difficult claim to win on, and the reason why, and I'm sure Larry's aware of this, is circulation to the foot is impaired by virtue of the diabetes itself, um, and it is just hard to prove that the care that was provided in this case. Uh, would have made any difference if he'd gotten better care. Now, it, it sounds suspicious the way he's describing it, you know, bringing blood up to the top like that from, from removing calluses, but I've had diabetic foot cases where the patient lost the foot. In fact, that's fairly common. Um, there's another type of injury you can have if you have a diabetic foot where the foot gets fractured. I mean, just by walking on it, it will fracture because the circulation's so bad. Uh, I'm not trying to say Larry's case is, is insignificant because to him it's everything, but typically we take cases where there's been amputations simply because jurors now look at this and say, well, you know, I know this is bad what's happened to you, but I've had other things worse happen to me, and that tends to overshadow any compassion they might have for the patient. And there would be a strong defense. I mean, they're, you're, you're going to hit, you know, the other side you know is going to come on pretty strong. Larry, I'm so sorry about what happened to you. Thank you for calling in. All right, we're going to take a break. If you're on the line, hold on. I promise uh, we will get to your call. So uh, hold on the line. We'll take a break. We'll be back right after this.